In terms of procedure, was there something you need to you needed to screen share before I start screen sharing? I seem to remember that. But sure. Yeah, we we got rid of that around uh, maybe a month or two ago. So now we just uh, so you can just go ahead and turn yours on, actually. Are you, are you ready, Arnav? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so so then uh, welcome all to uh, you know the latest edition of the Western Hemisphere Colloquium on Geometry and Physics. Um, just as a quick reminder about the format, so the talk is scheduled for an hour and then there's uh, questions afterwards. So during the main body of the talk, uh, if you have questions, please just type them into the chat window sent to everyone. And then uh, Arnav will pick them up at the appropriate time. Um, or you can wait till the end of the talk. And at the end of the talk, um, we'll have a usual question session where you can just ask your questions out. Um, so then uh, uh, yeah, we're very happy today to have uh, Arnav Tripathi. And his title is K3 Metrics. And uh, take it away, Arnav. <laughs> 
thank you so much for the introduction and thanks so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be able to tell you about what Max and I are doing. So first off, this is all joint work with Max Zimmet. Certainly anything original that I tell you today will be joint with Max. And this is really somewhat of a status update on a large program with uh, ambitious goals, perhaps two ambitious goals. We have some results that we already find interesting in some constructions that I hope to tell you about, but this is very much an ongoing work in progress. So I'll walk you through what we have right now and hopefully that's of some interest. So here's a brief outline of the talk where that says parts as opposed to pants. So first off, I'll give you some motivation for the questions that we're studying. Um, and as you can tell from the title of the talk, I'm interested in studying metrics, namely the Ricci flat metric on K3 manifolds. So I'll begin by reminding you briefly some ideas surrounding the stromer gauss asset program of mirror symmetry and giving you a Coulomb branch construction of these K3s. And the second part of the talk, I'll switch gears entirely, or rather as related by a duality, this duality being some form of 3D mirror symmetry. And in the second part, I'll tell you about Ivory-Killer quotients and Higgs branch construction of those K3s. And in the third part, depending on how far I get, as time permits, I might tell you something more about metrics. There, there's some quotation marks and you'll see exactly what I mean when and if I get there. So first off, here's the question which I'm interested in, which is find a compact Ramanian manifold, manifold M with Ramanian metric G mu nu satisfying R mu nu equals zero. Or here, this is the Ricci tensor, which is some partial trace of the full curvature tensor. So I likely don't need to motivate anyone that this is an interesting question. Mathematicians find this interesting in their own right as this is some interesting nonlinear partial differential equation. Physicists might even find this more interesting still because such manifolds form the basis of string compactifications uh, to get say 40 n equals two supersymmetry by type two compactification on a Calabi-Yau threefold. That's exactly something of this form with some extra properties preserving a little bit of extra supersymmetry. So this is an interesting question, and it's interesting to be able to find such manifolds, uh, to be able to say something precise about them. And there's something a little bit unfortunate in that if you try to just guess such a manifold by say, su suggesting that maybe it has some symmetry, some kind of killing vector, and forming some onsets for the metric that respects that symmetry and trying to write it down, you'll soon find that you can't actually have any compact Ricci flat manifolds with any killing vectors unless they're kind of trivial in the sense that you're just splitting off circle factors more or less. So that's difficult and it's difficult to find these guys. And the reason really that we know any exist is the theorem of Yao that if M is Kähler and has trivial first turn class, then there exists a Ricci flat metric. And in some sense, this is the reason why we know such manifolds exist uh, that are of interest to both physicists and mathematicians. But this theorem, of course, is not terribly explicit. And if, for example, you're interested in some string compactification, which you want to study uh, some kind of properties, some scattering data or whatever you might like to know, you would like to know something precise about, well, what is this Ricci flat metric? Can you write it down in some way? Can you compute it? And to date, we have no examples other than the trivial one of just M of flat torus. So this question of find in some sort of explicit manner, uh, and maybe I should say just not a torus, just to make this not trivial, has been around for quite a long time. And in fact, it's been around for so long that most people seem to think there just is no good answer. There can't be any good answer. And uh, talks that begin with the study of we would like to know something about the metric, uh, about a Ricci flat metric on a compact manifold, usually take it as a given that no such expression exists and the best we can do is numerical approximation. And there are many methods of good numerical approximation. Uh, recently, in fact, there's been a lot of development in using machine learning techniques and that's quite interesting as well. But it's, it would be very interesting to see if anything precise could be said. And I won't say more about the motivation now. So in some sense, we were left with this answer, which is certainly very non-explicit, uh, but you can go further and, okay, so here's another attempt at an answer. So the stromatory Yao's absolute picture of mirror symmetry says that if you're such a manifold, i.e. Ricci flat manifold, in particular being Kähler, such manifolds are called now Calabi-Yau manifolds, 
then perhaps you're in a very nice situation. This is not exactly the flow of logic, but there are reasons for what I'm saying now. Perhaps you're in a very nice situation where your Calabia manifold is fibered by special Lagrangian tori. Then there's this picture of mirror symmetry, which is T duality on these fiber tori. I just replacing the torus by the torus vibration by the dual torus vibration. And there's a picture. So here I attempted to draw a real fourfold fibered by real two dimensional torus, tori over some two dimensional base. There's some picture where if you probe this side by D zero brains. So I don't really know how to draw that. I'm not drawing the time direction here. And that's dual to some D two brain wrapping this torus over on this side, where again, I don't really know how to draw this. Then this Calabiao, whatever this mirror Calabiao is, let's give them names X and X check. This Calabiao is the moduli space of this point probe over on this right-hand side, whereas on, on this left-hand side, X check is produced, is produced by moduli of this D2 brain probe, or rather this D2 brain wrapping a special Lagrangian torus fiber on X. Now over on this side, the effective theory seen by this D2 brain probe, there's some low effective enter, there's some low effective theory, some kind of supersymmetric gauge theory. And we can do a computation to figure out what that what what the moduli space is in that low energy effective approximation. So if we want to produce X, start with the answer given by some low energy effective approximation. Uh, sorry, if you want to produce X check, start with some approximation on X, but there will be non-perturbative exponentially suppressed corrections coming from instantons that in this case are going to be holomorphic curves ending on this uh, whatever special Lagrangian torus fiber we were studying. So start with this answer, but as corrected by world sheet instant, let me just say, as corrected by instantons. So I very quickly sketched the SYZ program of mirror symmetry and most mathematicians seeing this uh, have probably seen this in one guise or another, but in the context of producing the mirror manifold, this guy over here is a complex manifold or is an algebraic variety. That wasn't the original context in which Yao at least being a differential geometer, I'm not sure about strong or Zasa, that wasn't the original context in which uh, these authors might've thought about it as a differential geometer. It's true that this X check carries not just some complex structure, some algebraic structure perhaps, but in fact, a full metric, a Ramanian metric. And you expect to be able to see that Ramanian metric over on this side. So over here, you expect to see some approximate metric. And this is called a semi-flat metric because it turns out to be flat in half directions plus some corrections to the metric. So in some sense, even from the early days, well, not so early, I mean, Stromatry I was asked was in the 90s, I believe. But for some time, even though we haven't really had explicit constructions of these metrics, these interesting Rigi flat metrics on these compact manifolds, we've had some idea of how to produce them, namely try to find some approximate semi-flat uh, computation and then corrected by exponentially suppressed corrections in some sense. Okay, that's fine, but terribly imprecise. Uh, in general, for a Calabia threefold, for example, it's not actually clear that the special Lagrangian torus vibration even exists. Joyce gave us very good reasons to believe it doesn't exist in full generality. So you need to understand the statement very carefully. Uh, it's not clear that the semi-flat metric exists. Uh, recently, it's been constructed in some examples of CY3s by Yang Li, but this is also a difficult thing to do in general. And even if one can compute instantons, where what that means perhaps is be able to count the numbers of these holomorphic curves ending on these 
special Lagrangian torus fibers, it's not clear what to do with those counts. Where is the formula that tells you if you have this approximate metric and these counts, here is the formula for how to produce the correct Ricci flat metric. So in generality, this is all missing, but perhaps if we impose even further additional structure, there's room to grow. So I'm now just going to pass to that situation of further special structure and suggest why you should believe that this has a better answer in that context. Okay, no questions as of yet. So definition. I'm now going to pass to hyperkähler geometry. So for me, let me just define a hyperkähler manifold of real dimension 4n to be a Ramanian manifold, m with metric g, with holonomy group equal to this compact symplectic group SPN. The quick remark is that such a metric G is automatically going to be reaching flat. It's automatically going to satisfy that interesting nonlinear partial differential equation that I began the talk with. This definition that I just gave is not the usual definition of a hyperkähler manifold, just in the sense that, well, so let me perhaps give a slightly different definition, uh, which is going to be approximately equivalent, but not exactly equivalent. It'll be true for a hyperkähler manifold as I defined it that MG, this Ramanian manifold, is scalar with, in fact, three different integrable almost complex structures. I'm going to call them IJK. There are endomorphisms of the tangent bundle that's squared minus one. That's what it means to be an almost complex structure. And they're going to have the property that inside this endomorphism algebra of the tangent bundle, the algebra that they span together with the identity morphism is, in fact, the quaternion algebra. In other words, they satisfy relations in addition to I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals minus one, like IJ equals K, JI equals minus K, and so on and so forth. A little bit more generally, if you have the structure, you can study any pure imaginary unit quaternion, zeta in S2. And what I mean by this, it sounds a little bit fancy, but it's really not terribly fancy. I simply mean any linear combination of these i, j, and k endomorphisms with norm one. If you study any such fellow, call it zeta, then you get a corresponding complex structure, J of zeta. And in fact, you get an entire package, you get a Kähler form, a real Kähler form, omega of zeta. And in fact, all of these guys also are homomorphic symplectic and carry a homomorphic two zero form that's closed and non-degenerate in a certain sense. And once again, that can vary depending on this parameter zeta inside what's called the twister sphere. So here's another quick remark. If I, Suppose, suppose I happen to know the Kähler forms at three interesting points on this twister sphere, say the original points that I called i, j, and k. Then in fact, this metric as a symmetric two tensor can just be calculated and I'll attempt to write it down um, in Einstein's summation notation. I believe it's something like this. So the particular formula isn't so important, but the point I'm trying to make is that all of the structure determines each other. Um, so when I say that I'm solving for the metric or that I care about the metric of some hyperkähler manifold, what I really mean is this entire package in some sense. So often for me, when I say I'm studying a metric, what that translates to is I'm trying to compute, uh, say for example, this family of homomorphic symplectic forms as zeta varies over all of these complex structures. Okay, so that being said, I can now define the main object of interest for me, which is a K3 manifold, and I'm simply going to define it per my definition above as a hyperkähler manifold of real dimension four. Okay, so the whole point of doing this was to say that in this setting where I have some additional structure, namely this hyperkähler whole twister sphere and all of that, maybe we can go further with the SYZ picture from before. So let's just go to this SYZ picture. And now we're no longer in the case where I have some color and I'm not sure if it has a special Lagrangian torus vibration or not. This kind of object, it's very easy to find K3s with special Lagrangian torus vibrations. Namely, if I start with an elliptic K3, i.e. one of these fellows that happens to be holomorphically fibered by elliptic curves by holomorphic tori, um, let me just copy and paste the picture from above. Oh, it's gotten messed up a little bit. No, it's actually fine. 
So if I start with an elliptic K3, then I claim that, that elliptic K3 has these tori which are holomorphic for some zeta in the twister sphere. If I hyperkähler rotate, I pass to some zeta that's orthogonal in the twister sphere. So there'll be a whole equatorial S1 of those. I claim that these tori are now going to be special Lagrangian, i.e. exactly in the setting of SYZ as we hoped for. And we can try to count in this hyperkähler rotated structure, these holomorphic curves. So these are now interesting counts. And in this setting, one might hope for interesting counts uh, that I'll denote here n gamma of u, uh, which are basically for mathematicians, something like open normal foot invariance. Let me introduce a little bit more notation. So here, my original K3 was fibered over some base P1. There were some number of singular fibers, or these fibers uh, singularized. So they look kind of like this, there's a singular point here. Uh, no, not like that. Uh, let me just denote this vibration down by pi. And when I say I expect these interesting counts, let me say that for any U in the base, away from whatever the singular points are, I'll denote that base is B prime, uh, P1 minus and generically 24 singular points, however many singular points there are. If I just study the torus pi inverse of U, this is some smooth torus fiber here, I can consider that as a special Lagrangian, and I can try to count J holomorphic curves uh, in a particular homology class, i.e. with second homology class in the relative homology of K3 with respect to this special Lagrangian torus fiber on which it's trying to act. Okay. Let me make the comment here that secretly, uh, this is not exactly the lattice which I want to study. I want a quotient by the base class as well. I'm writing that in very small notation because we don't really need to pay attention to that. Besides that, the usual long exact sequence in relative homology gives us that this lattice lies in between these lattice, lattices. This lattice right here is just H1 of the torus. So this is some rank two quotient lattice. That'll be important in a second. And this is some uh, 20 dimensional sub lattice. So we have this and just in case it helps, uh, very shortly we'll realize this middle lattice as the lattice of electromagnetic charges in some theory. The quotient is going to be the lattice of gay charges and the sub is going to be the lattice of flavor charges. If it doesn't help, uh, what's written is perfectly fine and well-defined mathematically. So we expect these interesting counts. And this idea of SYZ, again, says that knowing these counts allows us, or we would hope to be able to reconstruct the mirror as some sort of object. And the interesting question here is as a what? So certainly one answer that you've seen frequently in the math literature at this point is as a complex manifold. But one might hope for more and ask for as a full metric space. And I'm going to say Ramanian, but since I know I have this extra structure, I might as well just say as a full hypercalar manifold. I'd like to give some attributions at this point. So this idea right here, while falling from SYZ, it's been pursued heavily by Rose Siebert and many of their collaborators after that. But particularly in this original example of K3 itself, I'd like to mention uh, papers in the early 2000s by Fukaya and Kinsevich Slotelman that try to study this problem. Okay, let me make this a little bit more precise now. So definition, let me define this lattice, uh, eight, the relative homology of K3 with respect to this torus fiber. It's a local system on the base, it depends on this point U. And I'll define this map, it's called a central charge, from this lattice to the complex numbers simply defined by integrating some guy in this relative homology against the holomorphic two zero form on my K3. I make a choice, it's unique up to scale. And there are a few remarks as to why it's well defined. And the conjecture is that there exist these interesting numbers that are slightly resummed versions, if you like, of open genus zero gromal fitton invariants. You might be you might like to think of the resummation as analogous to passing from Gromal Fitton to Copert Marfafa invariants in the closed setting. And the conjecture is that these ball cross appropriately. I'm not going to write down the precise formula for that, 
but I'll say that they satisfy an interesting formula called the conserved soil and wall crossing formula. In other words, I expect these numbers to certainly depend on the homology class gamma, but I also expect them to depend on the point u in the base p1 minus the singular points. I expect them to be locally constant as functions of u in the space, but to have discontinu discontinuities at certain points in the space. Here I made this quick definition that two complex, two non-zero complex numbers I'll take to be parallel if their quotient is say a positive real number. And I'll ask that if the central charges of these two, of two different relative homology classes gamma line up, then I'll ask that these numbers jump around in some interesting way that's specified by an explicit formula that I'm not going to write down for you now. Okay, so this is a non-trivial conjecture in that it's not at all clear a priori that such numbers exist. But this conjecture, the only reason that I'm writing it as a conjecture, well, work of Yushan Lin, again, in precisely this case of studying open normal fit invariants of K3s, essentially provides us with these numbers. In fact, Yushan has produced these numbers in, uh, in many ways. He's defined them as counts in a certain tropicalization of this picture. He's also defined them as counts of solutions of more Cartan equations and some infinity categorical structure here. And he knows that they wall cross in whatever this appropriate way is that I'm not writing down for you explicitly. The extent to which I'm writing this as a conjecture is simply because I'm not sure and I haven't checked carefully if the resummation that I want, uh, it's already proven that you get integers rather than say rational numbers. But you'll see that this won't matter very much for what I'm about to tell you. So that being said, the hope is now to be able to reconstruct with the datum of these numbers, the full structure, the full package. And you'll see already at the end of this conjecture that I'm writing this holomorphic symplectic forms. That's one ingredient of what I told you the full package is. Certainly if you know all of these guys, you can reconstruct all of the additional structure. So in the situation above, if we are provided with such numbers and gamma u that wall across appropriately, the conjecture is that we have holomorphic functions that are denoted script x sub gamma of u that are some explicit function that I won't write down for you now, times some explicit integral. In other words, these are functions satisfying some explicit integral equation. And you'll notice that this is an implicit equation because the same function appears on both the left side and the right side. There's a bunch of stuff happening in the middle. For example, these counts that I just mentioned appear right here. This is some interesting pairing. This is in fact just the symplectic pairing on the two-dimensional quotient lattice that I told you about a second ago. This is some complicated integral a priori. The conjecture is that you have these holomorphic functions prescribed by iterating this integral equation, starting from the zeroth order guess of this explicit function that I didn't tell you about. And moreover, the conjecture then is that these functions if you take d log of one of them, wedge d log of another one of them, they actually provide for you the holomorphic symplectic forms. There's a lot that I haven't told you in this conjecture. For example, I haven't told you this explicit function, but you can all perhaps already tell from the superscript, the semi-flat, that this is some explicit computation uh, following from something previously, and indeed it can be written down in very explicit terms. These indices here are a priori also confusing. A priori, these script x of gammas were labeled by gamma in this relative homology. And implicitly, the claim that I'm making is that if these functions exist satisfying this integral equation, then the d logs thereof are only going to depend on the quotients of gamma in that rank two sublet, in that rank two quotient lattice. So I'm simply going to take an integral basis there and wedge those two together. So I've written the attribution in a bit of an incomplete way. This conjecture was originally formulated by these three authors, Gaia, Mori, and Naitsky, in a few papers in the late 2000s in the context of Hitchin systems. And I'm adding this attribution. This was a paper we wrote a few years ago, not so much to take credit in myself, but to indicate in what sense my co-authors took the situation of K3s and also formulated it in an analogous manner. The extent to which this is a conjecture may be somewhat surprising because it's not so much a conjecture in that here's a statement that we believe is true, 
but we don't yet know how to prove it. It's more a conjecture that says, if you have all this data, just do this. Here's a, an explicit algorithm, and this should be true. In other words, there's almost a direct method of proof. Just do it. So this is a bit surprising, and certainly one of the main things that's implicit in this being a statement that needs proof is that this iteration procedure right here actually converges. There's some sort of Bonnock contraction mapping principle that applies. I don't expect it to be clear from what I've written, but that that iteration procedure converges should be very cl closely related to the growth rates of these numbers right here. In particular, one would like them to be to have exponential or sub-exponential growth. And something that this paper did is explain why in the K3 situation, one still expects these numbers to have exponential or sub-exponential growth. Right, so the answer to the question in chat is no, but you will shortly see, in fact, I'll explain it now. So how might one interpret these instant on counts in gamma u in the K3 situation? I, in some situation such that the manifold you produce is a K3. And the answer is to realize that there's some interesting theory, which is not quite a 3D n equals 4 theory, but has the same amount of supersymmetry, such that its moduli space is a K3. And one way to construct such a theory is to take a 61 comma zero little string. For example, the decoupling limit of a heterotic five brain and compactify on down to three dimensions. And then the claim is that a branch of the moduli space thereof is a K3 surface, in particular a compact manifold. So that's certainly interesting. As you say, typically moduli spaces in field theories are non-compact. So there's something interesting in the fact that one took some non-local theory here. I believe this observation was made in a relatively early paper by Ken and Trilligator. All right. And following the guide or more nice key prescription, these counts might then be interpreted as BPS state counts in this theory. And the fact that one has exponential or sub exponential growth follows from the physical understanding of the thermodynamics of this little string theory as following, for example, from little string holography. So that's some understanding of why it's reasonable to expect this to hold in this situation. And it's an interesting question to try to actually compute these numbers. And that's the goal. That's the motivation of why one might like to compute these numbers, namely if you're not sufficiently motivated, then they recap. If you were able to compute these numbers and were able to exhibit that indeed they have exponential growth as physically expected, and that this guide of Warnitsky prescription converges and one's able to produce these functions and therefore produce these holomorphic symplectic forms and therefore produce a metric, then you'll provide a reasonably explicit Ricci flat metric because it's in particular a hybrid Kähler metric, so therefore a Ricci flat metric on a K3 manifold. And that's something that's been at stake for at least 40 years. So this goal is clearly somewhat of an insane goal because I'm telling you that embedded in this problem is at least the difficulty of this problem. And this problem has been notably difficult for quite some time now. And indeed, if you just think about this problem a priori and say, well, okay, so what do I know about these n gamma views? Well, perhaps I know that they're something like open normal wooden invariants, but that doesn't really help you compute them. Okay, fine. Maybe it helps you define them in some way or another. Maybe you know that they wall cross appropriately. Well, okay. Now this is at least a pure combinatorics problem that you can hand to a combinatorialist 
but it'll be far too difficult to work on. And at least no combinatorialist that I know and that I've spoken to is interested in working on this as a purely combinatorial problem. And the reason is because if you scroll up a little bit, I told you where the discontinuities in these numbers lie. It's at these places where these central charges line up. And if you reflect on how these central charges were defined, you'll see that these walls are dense inside, inside everything, inside this 40 module, inside the base, script B prime. So you have a bunch of numbers that satisfy some particular jumping rules but they're jumping densely often, infinitely often in kind of the worst possible sense. It would be very difficult for a combinatorialist to just start with some information, say some starting information that like left shift symbols exist and give you counts at certain points that are equal to one. It would be very difficult to track that around and produce some kind of compact way to express all these numbers. So this is difficult. And in order to have a good problem, one has to believe that there's some reason for progress and so there's, okay, this is the reason for caring in the first place, but why might one believe that this is tractable in any way? You could try studying a dual frame to this problem. Namely, what I just told you was essentially a Coulomb branch construction of uh, this moduli space. That was certainly the original setting of these authors when they studied this interesting class of 4 n equals 2 class S theories. When you do have 3 d equals 4 theories, as suggested is in the question in chat, there's an interesting operation that takes you to a different 3 d equals 4 theory. And typically what's constructed as a Coulomb branch on one side is constructed as a Higgs branch on the other side. In other words, on one side, uh, you have the, yeah, you have hypermultiplets getting beds. And that side is typically easier. Let me just remind you that if you construct a moduli space as a Higgs branch, you expect that to be classically exact and not, expect, and not experience quantum corrections. So if this were possible, this would be much nicer. And the hope essentially is to apply some sort of 3D mirror symmetry. Of course, this isn't 3D mirror symmetry applied interpreted literally, because I don't actually have a 3D theory. I have some theory coming to me from higher dimensions that I've compactified down. But there's no real issue with talking about the same ideas as 3D mirror symmetry for, say, a 4D n equals 2 theory compactified on a circle. In fact, even in the, if you know this terminology, even in the Braufman and Finkelberg Nagajima construction of Coulomb branches of gauge theories, cover gauge theories, for any gauge theory. If you start with the 4D n equals 2 gauge theory and try to construct the analogous Coulomb branch in the 3D mirror symmetric version, rather than taking spec of some equivariant homology, you take spec of some equivariant K theory. For 5D compactified on T2, you take spec of some equivariant elliptic homology. And in some sense, this is the inevitable outcome of asking what happens when you keep going to 61 comes here. So what I'll start doing shortly is to try studying a Higgs branch formulation, i.e. some theory such that the K3 is the Higgs branch of set theory, and to study the metric from that point of view, and hopefully by the end to compare it to what's happening on this side. I don't believe it's immediately obvious that the wall should be dense. But if you have some understanding of the period domain and how this holomorphic form varies, and how these classes vary, it's not difficult to see. I'm going to pass over this for now if that's okay. So I'd like to pass to this side, which talks about hypercalar quotients, because for example, if you have a gauge theory, um, a 3D equals 4 gauge theory, and you're trying to study its six branch, it's constructed as a hypercalar quotient. So this is the right mathematical setting. So let's study a compact group G acting on a manifold M. A priori, we can just suppose that it's symplectic, equipped with some symplectic form omega, perhaps it's Kähler, that would be fine. But this G acts in a Hamiltonian manner such that we have a moment map M to a frac G dual where frac G is the Lie algebra, we can form the symplectic quotient M mod mod G defined as mu inverse of zero mod G, or more generally mu inverse of C mod G, where C is any element in the invariant part of the dual Lie algebra. And one can check more or less directly that if this is a good quotient, say for example, C is a regular value of the moment map, 
and g acts freely, or at least with finite quotient singularities at most, then this inherits the structure of a symplectic manifold or symplectic orbifold. In slightly more generality, if I'm in this hypercalar setting where I have a compact group G acting in tri-Hamiltonian fashion on a hypercalar manifold M, such that I get a triple of moment maps, then for any Xi in the third power of this invariant dual Lie algebra, I can form mu inverse Xi mod G. And this then, in good situations, inherits the structure of a hypercalar manifold. This is a construction due to let me not write it out now. Hitchin, Carl Hayde, Lindstrom, and Rochick. All right. So are there interesting examples that you can construct in this manner? So I'll tell you an early example from, I believe, the mid-80s due to Kronheimer that constructs a family of manifolds known as ALE manifolds as hypercalar quotients. So suppose that you have a finite group, ga a finite group gamma acting on C2 preserving its hypercalar structure. In other words, you can check that to act on C2 preserving hypercalar structures to be a subgroup of SU2. So suppose you have a finite subgroup of SU2. Then Kronheimer is going to explain how to get some interesting family of hypercalar manifolds to forming C2 mod gamma as hypercalar quotients. This work was redone a few years later and cast into physical terms and interpreted in broader generality in a, in a very nice way by Douglas and Moore in the context of D brains. Orbifold singularities. So I'll tell you that construction now. From the physical point of view, you might suppose that if you have a brain probing some orbifold, maybe you just take all the pre-images of it by some method of images that'll thicken to some gauge three via Chan Payton factors. There are likely some equivariance conditions. And by what I'm about to write down, you could perhaps even convince yourself that you could have guessed this answer. But rather than guessing, you could have foreseen this paper to see it worked out nicely and carefully. So as I just mentioned, if I define R of gamma to be the regular representation of gamma, which at first blush you should just think of as some vector space of dimension equal to the order of gamma, I could study unitary matrices on this regular representation. Again, at first blush, you might guess that this simply is the gauge group once you take your, all your gamma many brains. In fact, there's some equivariance condition and the Craig group to study imposes some relationships. It's this fellow that I'm about to write down. Here, what I mean by this is the subgroup of U of R gamma commuting with some particular subgroup thereof. So note that gamma itself acts in a unitary manner on the regular representation just by left multiplication. So gamma is itself a subgroup of U of R gamma. And by this, I simply mean all elements of U of R gamma that commute with all elements of gamma sitting inside there as a subgroup. A is defined more or less similarly, and I'm just going to write it down without much comment. So here you study the Lie algebra of unitary matrices tensored up with C2 and gamma equivariance on this, where gamma acts by some sort of adjoint action on the unitary matrices and by the initial defining action on C2. And the theorem of Kronheimer is that this family of hypercalar quotients for Xi varying in this Lie algebra is, we'll simply say, an interesting family of hypercalar manifolds. deforming when C is equal to zero, the orbifold C2 mod gamma. From a physical point of view, this is likely a story you already know if you care about the subject, namely these D2s or a single D2 probing this orbifold singularity gives you a 3DN equals four gauge theory. This is the hypercalar quotient which returns the moduli space and you can deform it by these these, which are FI parameters on this side. So what's the reason for believing that we have hope to try to make progress on this theory when I instead have a K3 manifold and I'm trying to produce a K3 manifold rather than this, as you say, non-compact ALE manifold? Okay, so I'm trying to study a D2 probing a K3 setting. 
And the main observation is that some K3s, again, arise as flat orbifolds, namely, they might arise as a flat four torus modulo the Zima 2 involution action, or written as a quotient of C2, they might arise as C2 mod this rather quadruply affine group, Z to the fours, that might direct Z mod two. And now the hope or the idea might be that if you want to realize K3 as a hypercalar quotient, you perform the Kronheimer construction or the Douglas Moore construction for this much bigger group, Z to the fours, that might direct Z mod two acting on C2. So this is fine. And you could formally proceed by studying the regular representation, which will be some something like infinite, or the regular representation is certainly going to be an infinite dimensional vector space. You could study unitary representations on that, which will be infinite by infinite matrices in kind of a very infinite way. You could try to formally study the subgroup. You could similarly formally try to define A. And this does make sense, but it's much more geometrically meaningful to try to work in a different frame. So it's easier both psychologically and mathematically to work in a t-dual frame. With a d6 wrapping this flat orbifold. Mathematically, this is some form of Fourier duality. And depending on time, I was going to illustrate why this is a reasonable thing to do. Oh, my iPad is fast, so I actually do have a little bit of time. Let me try to indicate right now why it's reasonable to try to go to some Fourier dual presentation. So let's study a much easier situation. Physically, if you like, I'm studying a D2 probing a circle as T dual to a D3 wrapping that circle, and I'm studying the induced gauge group. So for mathematicians, just, well, I'm gonna tell you a mathematical story now. Um, what I was doing, so let's take, instead of gamma, this intensely infinite group, I'll just take gamma equals Z. And this will be the core idea that'll build up everything else. And let's study G, or let's attempt to study G, which is supposed to be the centralizer or the matrices that commute with gamma inside unitary matrices on its regular representation. Okay, well, unitary matrices on the regular representation of gamma, just at some informal level, the regular representation of gamma is just some vector space with the base is indexed by Z. So matrices they're on are some kind of unitary matrices that are infinite by infinite. So I don't really know how to write this, but I've, I've got entries A, I, J, where I and J are both just integers. So, okay, that's what a matrix is. And then there are a couple of conditions, namely that they need to commute with this fellow. So, okay, let me start writing some elements. So suppose I've got A0, 0, 0 here. I guess this guy would be A11, one, one, A minus one, minus one. And then I'm always a bit bad at figuring out which index increases. I think this is A10, and this is A minus one zero, and I think this is A01, and this is A21, um, and so on and so forth. So I have all of these entries. You can check that the condition to commute with gamma, or equivalently just to commute with the action of one in Z, is that Aij is equal to a i plus one comma j plus one. Just multiplying this. The, the element one inside z interpreted as a infinite by infinite matrix is essentially the matrix with all ones on a subdiagonal or perhaps a superdiagonal, I'm not sure. So formally performing the commutation, you find this. So in other words, I'm studying matrices that satisfy this condition, in other words, this column just is the same as this column, but just shifted down uh, by one. Good. And if you try to ask yourself, what is the datum of such a matrix now? Well, it's equivalent to just studying one column. In other words, just a, just a column of numbers 
and com complex numbers. So, okay, what is the datum of an integrally labeled list of complex numbers? I might more provocatively write it as little l2 of z. Well, that's the same as maps from l2 maps in this case from the circle to the complex numbers. And I haven't yet imposed the unitarity condition, but I claim that if you do impose the unitarity condition and see what you get, you find that you naturally get maps from S1 to the unit circle inside here. If you were a physicist, you probably expected this answer some time ago, because that is the natural gauge group of a D3 brain wrapping a circle. Okay. But it's very pretty to see the these infinite by infinite matrices, where by this I simply mean this subgroup that I've written down here. It, it is exactly the same as this guy. You've more or less matched up the datum now, you can match up the group structure, and it's very pretty how it all works out. So this is a nice example of 4A duality that I've never seen before, but there you go. Okay, so that being said, now, rather than working with these very infinite by infinite matrices, I'm going to study, you might be able to guess already, something like maps from T4 to some group. It's not, not going to be U of one now, it's going to be U of two essentially because I have that, I had that extra Z mod two factor. So here then is the theorem. Uh, I'm labeling this as a theorem in progress as Max and I continue to write up all the details. But let me start with script G first. So script G being the, the group by which I'm about to quotient. If I consider maps from T4, there's a little hat on this because this is actually a dual T4, but no matter. If I study maps from T4 to the compact group SU2 that are Z mod two equivariant, where Z mod two acts on this T4 by involution and acts by conjugation by say one zero zero minus one on SU2. And script A, you can check that it's a similar exercise to what we did above but you'll discover that you get Zeeman two equivariant connections on a trivial principle SE2 bundle over, fracti over T4. Then there's a bunch of stuff to say that I'm just borrowing. Then script A naturally has a hypercalar structure. Script G acts on script A in a tri-Hamiltonian fashion. And for generic C inside this space, the space of the five parameters that one expects, the claim is that script A mod script G is indeed a smooth K3 manifold. So that's the main result of this part of the talk. And I'll certainly pause for questions, of which there are none. So I'll continue. There are many things to say about this theorem. Uh, I seem to have a bunch of remarks lined up for myself. So, okay, let me make some of these remarks now. First of all, this certainly realizes K3 manifolds as hypercalar quotients of some big group G acting on some big space A. And this space A is just some infinite dimensional vector space. So this remark that I've labeled Hitchin is that Hitchin in his survey on hypercalar manifolds in uh, the early to mid nineties asked precisely the question of, well, many interesting hypercalar manifolds that we know are produced by hypercalar constructions of flat vector spaces, for example, what we now know as Hitchin moduli spaces were constructed as such. Can you construct compact hypercalar manifolds in such, fan, in such fashion? Again, besides from Tori. I'm a little bit surprised because I think already at that time, he probably knew how to do this using his own ideas. And for example, the ideas of Mukai from earlier in the eighties, namely you can realize K3s as moduli, of, moduli spaces of sheaves on other K3s. Uh, in good situations where you don't have singular, uh, in, in good situations where you don't have singularities arising, those moduli spaces of shoes may be realized as moduli spaces of anti self dual instantons, i.e., exactly some hypercalar quotient construction of this form, because in whatever situation I'm talking about, the moment maps exactly impose some anti self duality condition. So, provided that one can choose a Mukai vector or churn number, churn numbers appropriately, you can do this and indeed one can do this. So I, I believe Hitchin should have already known this, but maybe this didn't satisfy him. And I'll 
formulate my own opinion as to why. I'm not sure if this is what he had in mind. So Hitchin in the early to mid 90s asked, well, okay, this resolves that K3s may be constructed as hypercalar quotients of flat spaces. To make a few comments about this, this theorem immediately shows that the K3s that are produced in such fashion do have Ricci flat metrics, because in particular, they've been produced as hypercalar quotients. All of the packages, their homomorphic symplectic form, their Kähler form, that's all there. And you can just write down in some sense. It, it's not very explicit yet, but this construction gives you that they carry Ricci flat metrics. So in, in that sense, we perhaps finally have a construction independent of Yao's theorem that yes, we do in fact have non-trivial, non-toroidal compact Calabi Yau manifolds, compact Ricci flat manifolds, which are suitable for the purpose, for example, of string back vacations. This is a little bit overbearing because, well, like I said, Hitchin already knew that, or sh should have already known that K3s may be realized as hypercalar quotients of flat spaces, but those are flat spaces built out of K3s themselves. And if you don't already know that the K3 is hypercalar, well, it's a bit circular. But this is a bit overwrought because you can also construct them as certain moduli spaces of instantons on T4. And certainly you do know that that's hypercalar. So I don't really want to claim that this is the first Yao independent proof that compact Ricci flat manifolds exist, but it's certainly interesting. And I believe this is certainly an independent of Yao proof that K3 manifolds carry Ricci flat metrics. So when I say K3 manifolds, I haven't yet told you which K3 manifolds I'm obtaining. The implicit claim here that I'm not going to write down is that we can actually obtain all smooth K3 manifolds in this fashion. And it's interesting to count the moduli. So this space is actually a fairly interesting space, the space of FI parameters here. Namely, script G is roughly maps from T4 to frac SU2. So this is something about invariant maps like so, or there's some kind of invariance condition. And it's not at all clear a priori that this invariant condition leaves room for any interesting parameters here. Certainly one doesn't expect to be able to, whatever the invariance condition is, one doesn't expect to be able to just pick kind of an arbitrary map because then you would have way too many FI parameters. You would have infinite dimensional families just by taking random smooth maps. And you don't expect infinite dimensional families of K3s. So this invariance condition must do a lot of work and interpreted naively, it really seems that you're left with no interesting maps whatsoever. And there's something very interesting here in the fact that we actually need this du dual. So maps, whatever they are, are some sort of functions. This dual turns us more into distributions from, again, equivariant distributions from T4 to frac SU2. And now there's room for interesting dis distributions, i.e. they're exactly delta distributions, delta, delta distribution supported at the 16 fixed points of Z12 acting on T4. So that's what these guys are. This space is 16 real dimensional, which provides for, when you multiply by three, 48 real degrees of freedom, together with the degrees of freedom of the T4, you can check that you get 57 degrees of freedom for the K3, which is the correct dimension of its moduli space. And in fact, there's a little remark here that I'm not going to expand on more, that you can also add B field and get the full 0420 moduli space. There's a remark here that maybe I'll say briefly, but there's nothing particularly special about the orbifold T4 mod Z2. That's one example of a limit in K3 moduli space that is a flat orbifold, but there are in fact 10 such, and they all give you interesting quotient constructions. While this talk was motivated by caring most about the compact case, there are non-compact cases to which this applies as well. For example, C times T2 mod Z mod three or Z mod four or Z mod six. Those give you when you turn on the FI parameter deformations, moduli spaces associated to Minahan and Mishansky field theories. And those are interesting to study as well. Shortly, we hope and expect to be able to extend this to other compact examples, such as Hill Band K3. Finally, this last remark is that phrased in this language where I'm studying connections on a bundle on a four manifold, and I'm studying a gauge group of maps from that four manifold to the structure group for that bundle, 
This should remind you very much of the work of Donaldson in the 90s, where, as I alluded to before, the moment maps are essentially just taking a connection A to its curvature. In this case, since we have three moment maps, it in fact takes a connection A to the self-dual part of its curvature. There are three self-dual directions in the second cohomology. So the moment map equations are essentially trying to just solve the equations, finding connections whose self-dual curvature is zero, and then of course quotienting by some gauge group. So this very much feels like the sort of moduli spaces of instantons. Maybe the only thing that'll add immediately is some kind of equivariant instantons because you have Z mod two playing in the game the whole time through. Moduli spaces of equivariant instantons on this T4. And it looks like this is the sort of map, the sort of moduli space that one's trying to study. We are constructing K3s as moduli spaces of equivariant instantons on this hat T4. And to a large extent, this theorem, the mathematical work that we need to do in proving this theorem parallels the mathematical work that Donaldson had to do in applying, for example, implicit function theorems uh, for maps of Bonnach spaces to cut out manifolds, applying index theory to compute the dimension of said manifold, and so on and so forth. But of course, we're not actually studying self-dual curvature equal to zero. There's a deformation on the right-hand side induced by the CFI parameter to take us away from the flat T4 mod Z2 limit. And really, we're trying to study connections whose self-dual part of the curvature is equal to some prescribed linear combination of delta distributions supported at the fixed points. So I need some deformed equivariant instantons here. And independent of anything else that I'm telling you in this talk, this just seems like a very interesting problem to study in some generality. Namely, spaces of connections whose curvatures or self-dual curvatures are not zero, but are supported as some delta functions. The final thing that I'd like to say is that if you try to solve this equation, self-dual part of connection equal to some delta function, you can try to find explicit solutions. And I've written this as a theorem and the proof is essentially one line because whatever this operation is in terms of the connection, it's some nonlinear partial differential equation. The linearization of it, the linear part of it is an elliptic operator. So you can find an elliptic uh, Green's function for that elliptic operator if you wanna solve this equation and simply, simply keep applying it to this right-hand side. Because there's some nonlinearity, after you apply the Green's function, you won't have actually solved the equation, but there'll be some correction term. You apply the Green's function again, and you iteratively try to keep applying it. And this is a usual strategy for trying to solve nonlinear elliptic partial differential equations. If you do this, and if you could do this and produce an entire series that converged in some sense, then you would have solved the moment map equation. And in fact, up here, in this hyperkähler quotient construction, we know the entire package of hyperkähler information on this flat vector space, the homomorphic symplectic forms, for example. If we know exactly how to cut out the solutions of the moment maps equations inside there, then we can explicitly restrict and watch those restrictions descend to the quotient by this gauge group. And that would give us explicit holomorphic symplectic forms on the quotient, which I'm telling you is a K3 manifold. In other words, if I could explicitly solve these moment map equations, I would be able to produce for you the holomorphic symplectic forms and therefore the metric on K3 manifolds. So somewhat surprisingly, by studying this 3D mirror symmetric Higgs branch construction point of view, we independently found our way to a construction, to a potential construction of Ricci flat met metrics on K3 manifolds. As of now, we can only formally do this and try to produce higher and higher order solutions in powers of C. And I won't tell you exactly now, but if someone asks me that question period, I will. But the hope is independently to try to study this series and try to study if it, we can show some finite radius of conversions with C, because then we will independently on this side have produced some Ricci flat metric. But to finish the talk and to tie the two parts of the talk together, the colon branch construction from part one and the Higgs branch construction from part two, even if we only have a formal series construction, that's sufficient to construct a formal expansion for the metric as formally deformed away from the flat overflow point. 
And then returning to the Coulomb construction to try to read off these numbers, if one accepts these conjectures. Namely, even a formal expression for this in some deformation parameter away from a simple point, like a flat orbifold point, would certainly be enough to read off the string of integers. And that's also something that we've done to first order in the deformation parameter and obtained good, uh, good matching with what we expect. And we hope to be able to do this to higher order soon. So that's my talk. And those are two potential approaches to the Rigi flat metric on the K3 manifold. Thank you for your attention. All right, uh, thanks Arnav, let's thank the speaker. And so now we have time for questions. So if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand using the, the Zoom, you know, raise hand feature. Yeah, Ben, what's up? Oh, great. great. Uh, Oh, can you not unmute right. yourself? There we go. Now I can unmute myself. Um, yeah, great talk. Uh, thanks. Um, I have uh, maybe a couple of questions, but I'll ask one, which is this strategy in part two of the talk, um, where you realize this uh, 3D theory that's been reduced from 6D uh, as a Higgs branch. Can you also do that with the original Gyota Mornitsky examples and produce those spaces? Like, I'm just thinking of like the Uguri office space is like the simplest example. That's the one I always like to keep in my head. Uh, can I do that there, which is like much easier than your K3, K3 thing um, to produce a hyperkähler quotient of that space? So the answer is we know how to do this hyperkähler quotient construction whenever we start with some point in the moduli space of our hyperkähler manifold is a flat hole. Uh, so, sorry, say that again. It's a what? I'm able to do this whenever I have some point in the moduli space, which is a flat orbifold. Uh -huh. So for example, for uh, let's, let's stay in real dimension four for the moment. There are several interesting examples of ALG and ALG star manifolds. Let me, let me stay with ALG, which we expect to be produced by 4D equal to two, or they're classified now, actually. Um, so those correspond to interesting 4D n equals two superconformal field theories, namely SE2 and F equals four. Uh, there are three Archeris Douglas theories and three Minahan Nemeshansky theories. The SE2 and F equals four theory and the three Minahan Nemeshansky theories have these flat orbifold points. And so we expect to be able to say something about them. Your Archeris Douglas theories do not. And so unless we do some trickery like embedding them in some way, there is not a direct hyperkähler quotient construction. So I can't tell you much about their BPS state counts, although I don't really need to. Those aren't uh -huh. but, but you said at some point that this 3D, like from 3D mirror symmetry, you expect that these theories do have some kind of 3D mirror partners, which. Yes. Uh, but sure. those are not necessarily hyperkähler quotients, those mirror partners. So the answer is there, there's surely, I mean, you, you could just think, okay, what is a D2 brain probing whatever this hyperkähler manifold is? And that, that's fine. I, I just don't have a good description for you um, unless well, I can't write it down in some nice way to the extent that you believe what I wrote down here uh, by these infinite matrices or this, these connections is nice and that I can explicitly describe all the data. It just is something which I'm not really sure what it is. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Uh, other questions for Arnav? What's up? Go ahead. Oh, another. Sorry, another I had to raise my hand again to unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> since no one else is asking, I'll just ask my second question, which is uh, you, you said this thing that I'm supposed to, so I've never, I've seen several talks about this. I've never managed to know what little string theory is. Um, uh, and I know what the BFN construction is. And you, you said, you made a remark like, oh yeah, if you do the Braverman Finkelberg Nakajima construction, you know, 3D, 4D, 5D, you take cohomology, K-theory or elliptic cohomology of, of the space. And this 60 theory is supposed to be some 60 analog of that construction. I, is there a way to explain that slightly more mathematically or somehow justify that to me? Not that I'm willing to speculate on while I'm recording. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fair. I, I think there's something interesting to pursue there, which, oh, what the hell, maybe I'll speculate a little bit. Uh, which might 
point to a construction of some moduli space of K3s, I'm not sure exactly which one, over the integers nat naturally, because something that I find interesting about the BFN construction is it naturally gives you spec of some homology which exists over the integers. If you interpret it correctly, I think it might even give you some kind of refinement to the sphere spectrum. So I certainly find this provocative to think about, but I have much more somehow down to earth problems to think about before so I don't think about that in much detail. Cool, thanks. So I also have a question. So, so you mentioned that, you know, in the early part of the talk that because of, you know, because of some arguments about thermodynamics of little string theory, you believe that the growth of the BPS counts in this, uh, in this uh, K3 theory are kind of under control. Um, have you tried to study them like directly using like string networks or something like that? For the most part, no. Just because string networks I feel would get out of control pretty quickly. Uh, have, have, you, have you studied, well, okay. So there are two things that you could do. You could start with some relatively under control gauge charge and try to increase the multiplicity. That's the sort of thing that seems to lend itself well to constructions as you know. That doesn't really work that well, even in our case, because there's no, I don't think there's really a very relatively simple gauge charge because everybody winds around itself and starts hitting itself almost immediately. I'll confess that I haven't really thought about spectral networks as much. We've mostly studied this in a string web's point of view, but I, I suspect that simply due to the compactness of the base space, things are going to, and I mean compactness of everybody inside, I think things are going to become unwieldy. Got it. Um, and also, since you since you mentioned uh, there, that there's this case that's kind of intermediate between the four dimensional theories that are the simplest ones to think about and the K3, which is in some sense the hardest one. So in between there is the five dimensional gauge theories. Um, have you thought about that? So similarly, we can perform a construction for the family of hypercalar manifolds that deform, it's a ALH family that deforms, uh, let me just get the, everything correctly, uh, C star times T2 mod Z2, I suppose. So that's an interesting ALH manifold and we have a hypercalar portion construction of that. And we could try to study its uh, BPS state counts. So I just don't have anything particularly immediate to say because even in the K3 case, I don't have anything too immediate to say about the BPS state counts other than the first order construction that we've done. Honestly, most of our effort right now is in trying to soak the details of this theorem and then maybe directly study convergence here. All right. Well, then, uh, if there are no further questions, um, then uh, I think it's time to call this session of the WHCGP to the end. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. And uh, so I'll invite you all back here in. For in two weeks' time, April 19th, uh, and our next uh, talk will be from Cody Long and